This summer, members of the Green Party of England and Wales will be voting to elect new members of the executive of the Green Party, commonly known as GPEX. Now, members of GPEX are elected to specific portfolios, and today I'm going to be joined by one of the candidates for the policy development coordinator position. But before I introduce them, I just have one thing to ask of you all, which is that you scroll down right now and hit subscribe. So without further ado, I will introduce the candidate that we have with us today. Now, I say candidate, uh, you will see that that candidate takes the form of two separate humans. That's because they are standing as a job share. So to introduce the first half of that job share first, um, Dylan, it's an absolute pleasure to be joined by you today. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing very good, Chris. How are you? I'm good. This is the fourth of these I've recorded today, so I'm a little bit tired, but I'm getting by. Uh, Tom, how are you doing today? I'm doing brilliantly, thank you. Fantastic. So uh, for viewers, I'm going to put a series of questions to the candidate uh, that we have today and um, each half of the job share will choose whether they want to both answer each question or whether only just one of them will. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll take it from there. So the very first question I have for you is hopefully the easiest and most straightforward. It's why are you standing to be the Green Party's next policy development coordinator? So I think um, a really big reason that Tom and I are standing is because we recognise that at the moment the policy development process isn't as inclusive and representative as it should be. So Britain, England and Wales is a very diverse two, set of two countries, but um, we've heard from the previous policy development coordinator and people involved in the policy development process that it does not represent the diversity that even this party holds. It tends to be older, more male, more heterosexual. And so we kind of want to expand that out to give our policy the ability to have the lived experience that um, defines how policies affect people in real life. We don't, I'm not going to know, and Tom isn't going to know um, policies um, impact on communities that we're not a part of and that don't affect us. And so we want to expand that out and make sure that all of our policy is as inclusive as possible. And our process brings in people to co-create our policy to ensure that we're all as inclusive and open-minded as possible, really. Right, and Tom, did you want to jump in there? Uh, yes, I do. Um, so we're both very passionate about policy. We both have worked on policy quite a bit, and we want to make that policy process more inclusive and more a available, available to members to understand. I know when I first started writing conference motions, I didn't really get how it all worked. And so I kind of I didn't get the policy working groups. I didn't get how to properly write things. And so we want to kind of make that process a lot easier to understand. We want to work collaboratively with the policy working groups to help more people from across the party get involved in the policy process. Brilliant. So uh, you touched on some of this already, but just wanted to ask you um, really specifically. Uh, the current, the party's current policy development and making process. What do you think is currently working about that, and what do you think needs to be improved? I'll let you um, start on that one, Tom. Yeah. Um, so, what's working for at the minute is that it is a very democratic process, and that's something that our party has that not a lot of others can say they do, especially not the two main parties. Is that our policy is very much guided by members, and that is something that works brilliantly, and we need more of, not less of but it can be a bit intimidating. The information is not always easily accessible and people don't always know where to turn for help and support in that. And so we want to be a human face to the policymaking process to really help guide people. And we want to improve the policymaking process by making it easier to understand because especially for you know, newer members or members that haven't previously engaged in the process. It can be so difficult and we want to remove those barriers to make it easier to, to be part of. Yeah, thank, thanks, Tom. Um, just to come in on that, I think it's really important that, I, I mean, I think Tom's entirely correct that the democratic nature of the Green Party as a whole, and particularly our policy process, is one of our biggest strengths as an organisation that connects us to the grassroots and it makes sure that we stay in touch with the needs of people across England and Wales. But I think particularly with um, some of the smaller policy working groups, it can be very hit or miss on whether you're able to get involved and shape policy, particularly in the run up to the general election. We need all of our policy to be 
up to date and accurate and making sure that it really ref reflects um, the interests of not just the people in England and Wales or the members of the Green Party, but the people across the world. And one particular um, experience I have with this is trying to get involved with a policy working group myself, the local environment, local planning and built environment policy working group that um, is not as active as it possibly should be, and um, I would like to see it be. And so I think what I'm running for and what Tom's running for is to proactively reach out and help to encourage not just the pre-existing policy community to get involved and be rejuvenated, but to bring in new people who maybe don't know about the policy process or maybe don't think that their voice um, will, will be listened to and be heard. And we want to be that, that people saying that, no, your voice matters and we need, we need to get as many people as possible in those spaces, making those decisions to bring to conference and have membership vote on it. So one of the areas that the policy development coordinator is responsible for sort of overseeing is the policy accreditation process. Now, some viewers may not be aware of what this is, but essentially it's a mechanism through which the Green Party enables uh, policy motions which have a high degree of consultation, gone through a more rigorous process, to be um, essentially more likely to be voted on, debated on, debated and eventually adopted by the party at conference. I wanted to ask uh, the two of you, uh, how robust do you think the accreditation process currently is? And if there's any improvements that you want to see to that process? I mean, I mean yeah, I think um, it's really important that the accreditation process exists as if, if people have come to conference I've seen a lot of a lot of motions who get put to conference don't get heard, and so I think it's really important to have that process there to make sure that policies that are well thought out, that are well consulted on, are able to be voted on and either accepted or, or rejected by conference. Um, however, I do think there is a more significant role that special interest groups, what we might commonly know as liberation groups have to play in that role. For instance, um, the LGBTIQA plus Greens, which I'm the co-chair of, um, we put forward unofficially two motions to Autumn Conference in 2022 around access to fertility treatment and ending new HIV transmissions by 2030. Those were not accredited and because, because of a lack, because we didn't submit them to our development committee and because there wasn't, we didn't go through the accreditation process. But I think, for motions like that where it affects the liberation group special interest group in question there should be a way to add that into the accreditation process and have it say that this policy work this policy working group this liberation group has put it forward and said this affects us this affects our members we want to see this at least debated at conference i think that's really important to have in the accreditation process is there anything you wanted to add there, Tom, or? Uh, no, Dylan's pretty much took all the words out of my mouth. In fact, amazing. Right, so I want to move on now to talk about some of the wider issues on GPAC. So, of course, you're standing for Policy Development Coordinator, but uh, if you were elected, you'd be part of the wider executive. And there's a lot of responsibilities which are shared across the whole of the executive. And there's some issues that you need to be tackling as a member of GPEX. Um, and so I've got a few questions that kind of relate to stuff outside of the specific portfolio. And uh, the first of them is, um, so GPEX is the body within the party that has the primary responsibility for the party's finances and financial well-being. So I wanted to ask you what experience you have of working um, in organisations or with budgets that are difficult, complex and large. Uh, so I'll lead on that one. Um, so. Firstly, it, within the Green Party, um, I am on a local executive. I'm on the Sheffield Green Party executive. We are one of the larger local parties, but we are financially struggling with the costs of everything going up around election materials. And so trying to stay, I have got experience in working with the rest of the Sheffield executive to really trying to stabilise that and make it so we can still keep campaigning. We can still keep knocking on those doors and putting out those leaflets, which in a city like Sheffield is very difficult. Um, alongside that, I am a trustee of a local charity. I am a trustee at Sheffield Young Carers, which is a charity up here in Sheffield. And we have numerous projects and we are actually now on contract from the council as well to help people who have been affected by young people who have been affected by substance misuse. 
and that combined with the cost of living crisis has brought with a lot of cha challenges to um, the voluntary sector and I have experience in trying to stabilise those finances and reach out for funding and efficiently um, divert funding to places where they're going to be needed and where they are going to have the most impact rather than wasting them on some resources that are actually very low impact and very inefficient. Anything you want to add, Dylan? Or... Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say out of the job share, Tom is the most experienced with finances more than me. Um, personally, I a lot of my financial experience was in smaller organisations in my former local party. I'm currently a member of Sheffield Green Party, but I used to be a member of um, Northamptonshire Green Party, where I was the election campaigns officer, um, working to try to maximise our um, how efficient we're spending our limited resources as we know in the party we, that we're not funded by big business or bankrolled by millionaires so we rely on the small donations and so we have pretty small resources we made sure that we were under expense limits that we were um being robust and efficient in how we were spending money but that that's that's basically what i have to say so another area i wanted to talk to you about is the party's political strategy and ambitions. So GPAC's in parallel with the Green Party Regional Council, GPRC, which is the other of the two primary governing bodies in the party, um, has oversight over and steers and feeds into the party's political strategy um, and, you know, provides resourcing towards it and so on. Um, and what I wanted to ask you was, what do you think the Green Party needs to do right now to ensure that it can meet its political strategy and political ambitions? Uh, am I okay to start on that one? Yeah. Um, so as a campaigner, obviously, I'm very active in my local party. I have seen from both sides um, how our policy hits home. And I think what we need to do is we need to better showcase those policies that are actually going to make a difference to people's everyday lives and show how that difference will benefit them. Um, we have it where we're in a massive cost of living crisis. And alongside that, we have a government and an opposition party that are kind of kind of becoming more and more alike as the days go on. And we in the Greens have a, an image for a brighter, greener future. And we really need to showcase how that brighter, greener future will benefit your average person, the person who might be struggling to make ends meet, who might be choosing between heating or eating. Alongside that, we have quite good working relationships with members of GPRC already. And so we can take that experience that we already have with working with them and being in discussions with them to help collaboratively move our policy direction and our political strategy towards being the party of um, your average people, party of people who need help and the party of the people of the United Kingdom, because we really need to pivot towards that if we are going to make our um, ambitions a reality of getting more Green MPs, more councillors, and hopefully soon more London Assembly members and more members of the Senate as well. Yeah, um, I'd just like to jump in on that. So as LGBTIQA plus Greens co-chair, I'm on political committee, which is a group of the leaders, the parliamentarians and the co-chairs of the liberation special interest groups. And so a lot of that work is around understanding what the political issues of the day are and how we can respond to it as a party. And so my experience, my knowledge from that, my experience from that has really helped shape my understanding of what the Green Party is struggling to do. I think what people like to hear, what, pe what people on the doorstep from what I hear is they like to see Greens in action doing things. I was out in Newham just yesterday campaigning the by-election and I had people on the doorstep telling me that they had heard about the two Newham Green councillors who had just been elected and how much work they were already doing and just showing that to people that when Greens, when you do elect Greens, even if we're not a majority, even if we're just one or two members of a council, that we can get things done and make a real difference, the difference of that Green in the room, um, that really inspires people. I think we should be doing more of that. We should be showing people, telling people on the doorstep and in our communications, we see what our members of the House of Lords are doing, what our Assembly members are doing, what Caroline Lucas is doing and what our local councillors are doing because when you all build that together you show people that voting green is not just some pipe dream wish for a better world it's a real practical step you can take 
to improve the lives of not just yourself, but everyone else in England and Wales. And the last question I wanted to ask you uh, before I move on to my less serious questions, which I like to end on, is around uh, the party's handling of transphobia. So I think most members of the Green Party uh, who've been around for the last few years will be well aware of the problems the party has had in tackling transphobia within its ranks. Um, a lot of criticism has been levelled against the party's governing bodies for failing to tackle it. And what I wanted to ask you was, if you're elected to GPAX, what will you be doing to make sure the party proactively tackles transphobia? Um, if you just like, I'd like to lead on that particularly. So both myself and Tom are non-binary ourselves, we're both trans people. And so being elected to GPEX, which I the executive, would provide that almost that vision for people that being trans is not only just it's not something to be hidden away in the Green Party, not something to be ashamed of, but something that to be proud of, something that can that does not matter as a political issue when you get to the highest levels of the party because we need to be a party of inclusion and of diversity i do it at the moment the green party hasn't done enough on trans inclusion our policies are very trans inclusive but there needs to be more action from governing bodies um, i've been on the equality and diversity committee for the past year and a half and during that around the time of the diverse matters report that was commissioned we worked um, incredibly hard on the action plan that the executive had put forward at the Equality and Diversity Committee, we worked very hard on scrutinising that and making sure that all the actions that need to be taken are able to be taken. As Policy Development Coordinator, it's not our job to be changing policy, it's our job to be standing up in GPEX as a voice to say, no, this isn't acceptable, we have a duty of care to our trans members and our non-binary members and just members in general that see this um, this conflict in the Green Party and are disturbed by it. We need to make the party a safer place for people to feel welcome. And I, I like the, the phrase that you can't be tolerant of intolerance. We need to make sure that we're a beacon of progressivism and social justice. That's what I hand over to Tom. Is there anything you want to add, Tom? Yes, so um, both me and Dylan are on the LGBTI Career Plus Greens Committee. Dylan is obviously a co-chair and I am the international officer. And as an international officer, I have seen the effect that the transphobia within the party has had on our relations with other parties. Uh, I've, you know, obviously I've spoken to the Scottish Greens, the German Greens, and weirdly the American and Canadian Greens. And we definitely are standing out somewhat as a party that is really struggling with this. And so while we're on GPEX, we want to really be pushing the lessons that those parties have learned and that we've discussed with them and trying to fix this issue because, as Dylan said, we can't be tolerant of intolerance. And this is causing a lot of distress for our trans and non-binary members. And generally, our party does has had issues in the past and still does have issues in looking after um, members that may or may not be meant part of a protected characteristic, whether that's disabled members or LGBTIQA plus members and um, of members that are people of colour. And so on GPEX, we really want to stand up alongside um, e and and alongside our other people on GPEX and really push that we have a duty of care to our members and that we really need to show that we are a progressive party and that we will stand up for their rights when push comes to shove. So I promised to move on to my less serious questions. That's what I'll do now. And I'm going to put the first of them to Tom first and then to Dylan. Uh, so what is your favourite and your least favourite Green Party policy? So my favourite policy is probably SW303, which is around um, holistic and integrated childcare. Um, having seen what that's like, um, from being a young person, obviously, but as well from being a care of being a carer and seeing the stress that being a carer regardless of the age of the person you're caring for is like um, I think that's a massive need that need the main party is really willing to fill we've seen Labour diverging away from its universal childcare commitments and the Tories never going anywhere near it and so I think that's somewhere we can really stand out and be a party of the people is saying we want to provide this support regardless of income regardless of where a person is in the country, regardless of how many resources their council may have. 
we want to provide this to them so that everyone has an equal chance to live and to have their children looked after and their children to actually grow up safely and grow up being able to be a child rather than having to worry. And my least favourite, somewhat controversially, is pretty much all the population section of the policy document. I feel it's quite iffy, if I'm honest. There are parts of it um, that kind of focus a lot on overpopulation that I feel don't meet with our other um, our other ideals and our other views as a party. And I feel like part of, quite a lot of that section is actually in conflict with our views as progressives. And so I really, that's probably my least favourite. I think there's a lot of change that needed that. Dylan? Yeah, um, so full disclosure, I'm a bit of a planning nerd myself. So my favourite policy is in the um, local planning and built environment chapter, which is around um, the other, so saying the green, the green party through the planning process would seek to address the unequal distribution of land, property, power and money in the direction of social justice. I think that's really important, trying to our spaces, our communities to be as inclusive and as equal as possible to make sure everyone has the life chances and has the, really has the ability to just feel safe in life and just feel, have a good quality of life. I think that's really important as a, I'm a planning student myself. And so that's something I really feel connected to. And I'd have to agree on Tom with my least favorite bit, which is my um, population policy. I don't think, over, I think overpopulation um, can sometimes be um, misconstrued. We need to have a, a real conversation about how we achieve social justice um, while respecting everyone's rights, particularly in the global south and the majority world. Um, while meeting our ecological limits. And I don't think that will be done through population, the po current population policies we have. Excellent, thanks both. Now, my second question for you of these slightly less serious ones is what book has most influenced your politics? And we're going to Dylan first. Yeah, um, kind of somewhat linked to the my previous answer. My um, the book that's most kind of shaped my politics is it's called Confessions of a Recovery, Recovering Engineer Building for a Strong Town by Charles Marone, who is an American transport and urban planner, who it kind of shaped my understanding of how the built environment can influence people in ways that you wouldn't even imagine how building for cars instead of building for people can really decrease the quality of life. It can make um, employment harder to get, it can drive down wages, it can lead to financial problems in local areas and really trying to build for people and ha having a people first mindset is really important to me and that's kind of what sparked that interest and that joy in me. And Tom? I have a joint, I have a joint favourite if that's okay. <laughs> I couldn't Go on pick. then. I'll let, I'll let you have to. Yeah. Thank you. And um, firstly is Our Revolution by Bernie Sanders about really building a grassroots movement to engage people in politics and build a future that's better for us all. Uh, that really inspired me when I was younger and getting into politics. And a book I've read more recently is Paint Your Town Red about community wealth building and really getting both economical and social justice within our communities. Brilliant. Excellent reading recommendations from both of you. Uh, my next question is, if you were Prime Minister for one day, what one thing would you change, Tom? Oh, that's difficult. I think the first, the one thing I would definitely change is I would end privatisation of the NHS. It is causing so many problems and I see that both as someone who uses the NHS as a disabled person who is a carer and as someone who, who the voluntary sector provides training to the NHS they are struggling right now and the privatization that both um, the Tories and now Labour are pushing is not helping so from day one I would take the NHS completely back into public hands and use the resources that we have for the betterment of people and the service users and rather than to make money because making money off somebody's health is diabolical. And Dylan? It, it's a tricky question isn't it because there's so many things that have been that this country needs um, honestly, I would say implement uh, a carbon tax as my first 
first policy, give us the resources to do things like the massive installation program we want to bring things back into public ownership, to support communities, support our transport links. First thing I'd do, carbon tax, because two birds, one stone, basically. Carbon tax and a publicly owned health service, uh, all good things. Uh, Dylan, who is your favourite historical figure? Oh, oh, that's a tricky one. Ah, uh, I mean, that is, a, I, I probably have to say, if we're going a bit further back in history a bit, uh, I'd probably say Mary C. Cole, who was a nurse in the Crimean War, who was really underappreciated because of her um, ethnicity, I think, recognising the role that people of colour and people who were uh, who aren't stereotyped in Victorian Britain as British are uh, recognising the impact that they had on our country. It's really important and I think she's a good person to hold up as one of someone who did a lot of work on that and recognising that it, it we're, we're inherently I think a multi multicultural country and we should embrace that and celebrate that. Excellent and Tom? I think mine would have to be uh, Angela Davis she's an Amer she is still alive but she was more active a bit before I was born let's say and she's American socialist and um, she fought a lot for civil rights for black people she is a, ma a massive intersectional feminist as well and she is just a genuine inspiration through all the hardships she's had and yet she keeps on fighting and how she fights to uplift everybody is just genuinely extremely inspiring. Now on the topic of inspiring people my final question for you to Tom first is who in the Green Party inspires you the most? Okay so this is going to be I'll try and make it as concise as possible Natalie Bennett which is quite appropriate saying I'm from Sheffield. Um, she's actually the reason I joined the party. There was a protest in my city when Donald Trump came to visit the UK for the first time and I went to the protest and I saw her speak and she was so inspiring that I joined the party the next day. I th that woman has done more for, <laughs> more for me genuinely than anyone in the party ever has. She like brought up the idea of being a green to me when I was kind of politically homeless and didn't want to go over to Labour and knew very much that I wasn't a Tory and um, she just suddenly gave me this revelation of what it is to be a green and that it's a third way forward to a brighter future and I think that's probably my favourite green figure just because she's the entire reason. I'm and Dylan? Uh, since Tom had two books can I have two people? Come on then. <laughs> uh, I'd say the first person is Emily Fedorovich, who's currently the mayor of Kettering and is a councillor. So I'm originally from Kettering. I moved up to Sheffield about a year ago for university. But just seeing all the amazing community work that she does, all the all the like hard work she puts in to make Kettering a better place. She's kind of trying to save our local leisure centre. She's been trying to save our local green patch, which is a community garden. And she's been very invested in saving a woodland from um, warehouse encroachment. It's really all, she seems to have boundless energy for all these amazing things. And the second person I would say is Ash Routh, who is a fellow Sheffield member, um, who is currently on regional council with the former co-chair of the LGBTI plus greens. Every time I see her in action, fighting for what's right, giving these incredible speeches, speak on the doorstep to people, just being so inspiring and trying to trying to make not just this party, but this country and our, our city for me and Tom, just a better place. They both really touch my heart and make me want to go on. I'm sure Natalie, Emily and Ash will no doubt be extremely proud to have been named in that way. Uh, but that's all we've got time for. Uh, Dylan and Tom, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you very thank much. You. So this is, or that was rather, 
Uh, I think the sixth of my interviews with the candidates in this year's GPAX elections. There are still more to come. And the best way that you can make sure that you don't miss out on them is to scroll down right now and hit subscribe. Whilst you're there, please do also let us know what you thought of this conversation in the comments. And if you are able to, please do head to bright-green.org forward slash donate and fund the work that Bright Green does, including all these interviews, all the articles we publish on our, on our website and much, much more. So that's it from me. Thank you all so much for watching and I'll see you all very, very soon.